All right, everyone, welcome once again to the Sethery seminar. And today we have Peter Hawley from the Technical University in Vienna. And yes. Peter, it's great to have you. If I can meet you uh, in person, this is the second best thing. So looking forward to hearing one of your talks again. And today, Peter is going to talk about uh, asymmetric cut and choose games. Go right ahead, Peter. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so this is a uh, joint work with um, the Bristol Set Theory Group, that is Philip Schlicht, Christopher Turner, and Philip Welsh. And um, so I, I've, I've talked about this a couple of times, but I thought, I think nobody uh, in New York has heard me talk about this. Um, so I thought this would might be a good reason to talk about um, this paper like one last time, probably. Um, so it's kind of... Um, um, so in this paper, we kind of started looking at, um, well, as the title says, asymmetric cut and choose games, <clears throat> um, which is something that um, people like looked at in the 60s, I think. And then um, kind of some results were proven. Um, not so many of them were actually written or were put into actual papers that were published. Um, and yeah, and so we, so we looked at some of these old results and um, gave some proof of these results. We showed some new things and we generalized several results. Um, so yeah, this is kind of somewhere in between a, a survey paper and the research paper here. Um, all right, so let me get started. Um, the, so the, the idea behind these infinite games that I will be talking about um, is that of fair division. And so fair division, um, well, uh, for us now is the following. So assume we have a piece of cake, say, and um, we have two people, call them Anne and Bob, uh, maybe think of them as um, being children. And um, so we somehow want Anne and Bob to fairly share that piece of cake. And an easy way to do that is um, to have Anne first cut the cake into two pieces and then have Bob choose his piece and then Anne gets the remaining piece. And if you think about this for two seconds, obviously both have um, um, a fair chance of getting a well, a fair piece of uh, cake, because Anne, I mean, if Anne wants to act reasonably, she will like divide the cake into two pieces that seem to be of equal value to her. Then Bob gets to choose first. <clears throat> Bob gets to choose first. Well, and then Anne gets to choose one, gets to pick one of those uh, pieces that were of equal value to her. So this seems like a um, reasonable principle of fair sharing. And it's actually an old idea that was um, considered um, many uh, hundred years ago already. And um, so modern investigation of this principle in mathematics um, seems to have been initiated by famous people like Steinhaus, Banach, and Knast in the 1940s. Um, so they looked at things like extending this to a larger finite number of people and possibly many other things. I haven't really looked into their work. Um, and what set theorists did in the 1960s um, was to propose various um, infinite cut and choose games, which were kind of based on this idea of fair division and um, kind of um, building an infinite uh, game out of that. All right, so um, let's see. Ah. Um, so let me describe the basic game that I will talk about for a while. So this game has two players <clears throat> and they go by the names cut and choose. And you can possibly already imagine what uh, those players will do in the game. Um, so one of them will be cutting and the other one will be choosing. And so other than those two players, we have an infinite set X, which I think I will call the starting set a lot of times. Um, so that's just some set over which our game takes place. And we have a limit ordinal gamma, <clears throat> which will denote the length of our game. Mm. Oops. So, um, so how does the game proceed? It's actually a very simple game. Um, so cut gets to start and in the first move cut will partition x into two disjoint pieces and choose will pick one of them and let's call that piece x zero um i put disjoint into brackets because when i say things like cut partitions x into two pieces i always mean disjoint pieces all right so that's the first step and then now in the second step cut takes this x zero that choose has just chosen Partitions it into two pieces again and choose picks one of those pieces. Let's call it X1, et cetera. Um, 
Well, at limit stages, just take intersections of choices and partition those again. And so there's one rule here that if choose ever picks a singleton or empty set, they immediately lose. And as you will see in a moment, so this goes, otherwise this goes on for gamma many steps. And the goal of, of choose is kind of to get an intersection of their choices that is somehow large. And the goal of cut is to make sure that the intersection of choices of choose will be small. So for our basic game here, large just means non-empty. Um, and so it's also a reasonable um, condition to ask, um, well, to basically not allow choose to pick singletons or the empty set. All right, so that's the basic game. Um, Okay, sure. So choose wins if the intersection of all of the choices is non-empty and otherwise cut wins. And I can have a, oh, sorry, then this game has a name. I could, let's call it U, X, Gamma. So X is just the starting set, which we cut into two pieces in, or which cut cuts into two pieces in their first move. Um, and Gamma just denotes the length of the game. All right, so, let me maybe talk a little bit about this extra rule here. Can you see if I mark up things? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Great. So, so this is the extra rule that I want to like that this note refers to. Um, so, why do we not allow choose to pick singletons? Well, if we allow choose to pick singletons, then they have an easy winning strategy in this game because they could just fix an arbitrary. Well, I guess we assume that X is a non-empty set, and then they could just uh, fix an arbitrary element Y of X in advance, and then whatever partition they are given, they just pick the part which contains Y as an element. And then obviously, Y will be an, inter an element of the intersection of all of the choices, and this means that choose wins the game. Okay, so it's, it's a very sensible thing not to allow choose to ever pick singletons. Well, and obviously, if choose picks the empty set, there's not much chance of them getting a non-empty intersection at the end of the game. So that's very reasonable too. Okay, so I have a picture just to make sure you will remember this game throughout the talk. So this is our starting set X. This is cutting it into two pieces. And this is choose picking one of those pieces. We call it X zero. Now this is cutting X zero into two pieces. This is choose picking one of the pieces, which is X one. And then this is, well, supposed to mean that this goes to infinity. And then in the end, we look at the intersection of things. And so here we have maybe like two things in this intersection, say, and this would mean that um, choose wins the game. Okay, so I hope um, this is simple enough and easy to remember. So before I actually talk about any properties of these games, I want to simplify them already. Um, so for many practical purposes, it's nicer to just think of an easier version of this game, which is um, equivalent or basically essentially the same game. Um, and in this um, simplification, we will just have cut, repeatedly cut the starting set X into two pieces and choose picking one of them. And well, since in order to determine who wins, we're only interested in the intersection of choices of choose, well, it doesn't really matter. So after choose has decided for one of the pieces in their first step, it doesn't really matter in what way, like the other part that choose did not decide for in, in what way that is cut into two pieces. And we can just pretend that the remaining part which choose has not chosen in their first move is like cut into two as well in an arbitrary fashion um, by uh, cut in their second move, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, I can maybe go back to the picture again. So let's see, here we have a starting set. <clears throat> here we have the first move, choose picks X zero. And now um, in the second move in the original game, cut partitioned X zero into two pieces, but we can just imagine that like this, this partition also partitioning this white part into two arbitrary pieces. Um, and then it doesn't matter whether choose just picks subsets of X zero or larger subsets of the whole set, because in the end we will just look at the intersection of choices anyway. Okay, so let me let me give the definition of this simplified game, which should look even nicer now. And I will use the same notation for this simplified game. Um, so I guess I started with the other game because that's um, what people um, or how people um, defined these games um, historically or initially defined these games, as far as I know. But maybe that's for many purposes. This is the nicer definition. Uh. So in each move, cut just partitions X into two disjoint pieces and choose picks one of them. 
<clears throat> Deuce is not allowed to pick singletons. Well, and I guess they mustn't pick the empty set either. So the game goes on for gamma many steps. And in the end, Deuce wins if the intersection of all of the choices is non-empty. Right, so that's a very simple game now. So we just cut the starting set X into two pieces in each move. I mean, cut does that. Choose picks one of the pieces and we go on for gamma many steps. And in the end, we look at the intersection. Choose wins if it's non-empty, cut wins if it's empty. All right, so let's look at a very simple special case. Namely, let's play over a very small infinite set, which is the natural numbers. Um, so it's very easy to see that cut wins here. Um, and they just remove one natural number in each step. So in the first move, so in, so in each move, they should present the partition of omega. <clears throat> and in the first move, the partition omega into the, um, the singleton zero and the interval from one to omega. And then choose just has to pick the interval from one to omega. And then in the second move, well, they do the same with one rather than zero. So in the second move, the partition will be singleton one versus omega without singleton one. And the only thing that um, choose can do is pick omega without singleton one. Well, this goes on like that. Um, and then obviously the intersection of all choices is empty. So this is really easy and cut just wins this game. Okay, so, and an obvious observation, this has nothing to do with omega other than it's being countable. And um, and in the same way, for any gamma, cut wins the game on starting set gamma of length gamma. Well, gamma is a limit ordinal. I mean, I'm always assuming the length of the game is a limit ordinal. All right, so as we can observe from this already, so for choose to have any chance of winning, the starting set will have to be reasonably large. Mm. And so let me, so I want to talk about um, winning strategies for choose in a moment, but let me first um, show some observations about winning strategies for cut, which kind of show that they are not like super interesting um, because cut has a winning strategy in the game U kappa gamma. So that's the game with starting set kappa and limit ordinal length gamma, if and only if kappa is less or equal than two to the less than gamma. So that's kind of an um, easyish observation. Um, and um, okay, another argument shows that actually up to two to the gamma, choose at least does not have a winning strategy either. So I mean, above um, above two to the less than gamma, cut will not have a winning strategy, but up to and including two to the gamma, choose will not have a winning strategy either. So that's kind of an easy observation, but not, not like super easy. Um, but I, I, I mean, I don't Sorry, want to. Can I interrupt? Um, yes, can yes. you say something about y2 to, to the less than gamma, like what is going on here, just vaguely? Huh. I mean, just the, the intuition. So that's the bad thing if you give a talk about the big paper that you submitted already a while ago and haven't looked into it since then, I kind of forgot. <laughs> oh, okay, then it's fine. No, no, um, I thought it might be some something easier. Yeah, it's 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 like I mean the proof is like maybe like ten lines or so as far as I remember, but it is some trick you have to pull. I mean, I'm afraid I can't remember the trick anymore. Yeah, okay, that is fine. I can look it up and take. Okay. Um. Yeah. So sorry. Um. Right. So this gives us an easy example about the game that's um that's undetermined, because if you look at um say u omega, ah, sorry, u two to the omega omega, for example, or obviously u two to the, no, u two to the omega omega is a good example. So you play on the reals and you play off length omega and then this game will be undetermined. All right, um, so what I really want to talk about more uh, is, um, is choose, uh, how, when choose can win these games. Um, and choose can easily win at measurable cardinals. That's not even an exercise, really. So I guess you all know what a measurable cardinal is. It's a cardinal with a less than kappa complete non-principal ultra filter on kappa. And I want to call such filters measurable ultra filters. So I guess maybe people usually require normality as well. We don't ever need normality in these talks. I'm just using kappa complete, less than kappa completeness. OK, and then obviously choose wins u kappa gamma for arbitrary gamma less than kappa if kappa is measurable. And the proof is 
easy. Um, you just pick your choices. I mean, you just make choices according to one fixed measurable ultra filter. And then, I mean, the completeness of the ultra filter obviously gives you a large intersection of your choices if you're playing for any length less than kappa. So you're not just getting a non-empty intersection, you're getting a kappa-sized intersection of choices here. Um, all right, um, so what's a bit, a bit more interesting is that measurable can be replaced by certain forms of generic measurability. So let me um, give the definition. Um, so a cardinal kappa is generically measurable as witnessed by um, some notion of forcing P. If in every P generic extension, we have a uniform V normal V ultra filter on kappa, which yields a well-founded generic ultra power of V. So it's just like we have an ultra filter witnessing measurability of kappa and V, but this ultra filter doesn't exist in V, but rather in some um, P generic ex forcing extension. And well, there's an equivalent characterization in terms of elementary embeddings, which just means you have an elementary embedding in some forcing extension, and also the target model is allowed to uh, live as a class in some forcing extension. Okay. Um, and <coughs> a, an easy observation is that Juice wins the game on kappa of length gamma. Um, whenever kappa is generically measurable, with an extra condition that is the forcing needs to be less than gamma plus closed. And the argument is just a few lines. So let me give it, it's kind of uh, nice. Um, so <clears throat> just pick one. Um, so assume that kappa is generically measurable as witnessed by um, less than gamma plus closed forcing P. So P should be this witnessing forcing here. And just pick a P name U dot for a, um, well, a witnessing ultra filter in some P generic extension. And now in each step, choose doesn't just pick um, sets xi, but choose also picks conditions which forces their choices to be in that ultra filter. And it's a very easy exercise, which just takes two lines really, to see that you can pick those pi such that they, are, they form a decreasing sequence of conditions in p. And um, well, then here comes our the closer assumption on our forcing. And this tells us, well, if we've, if we've proceeded for um, gamma many steps in our game, this is less than gamma plus, so we'll have a lower bound of conditions. And obviously this lower bound forces um, the choices of choose to be in this um, generic ultra filter U dot. And well, if some ground, so that the intersection of choices is a ground model set and it's forced to be in the generic ultra filter. So in particular, this set cannot be non empty, ah, cannot be empty, so it's not empty. All right, so that's that's another easy argument. Um, um, question. Why do you need the well-foundedness of the ultra power? Hmm. I mean, it seems you just need a V normal, V ultra filter. Yeah. No. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, I mean, I just, um, I just um, have had uh, the well-founded ultra power here because it's kind of part of generic measurability, but it doesn't seem like we use it really. I mean, this being able to pick those conditions pi in a decreasing way doesn't use anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if it's stronger. I'm not sure to require the, I don't know. I mean, it should be stronger to require well-foundedness, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, you're right. I don't see where we are actually using it. Yeah, um, I have to think about that. That's a very good remark, really. Okay, um, but but let me, let me go ahead. Um, so um, let me present some classical results. Mm. So choose winning actually has large cardinal strength. Um, so that's a theorem due to Silver and Soloway from the 1970s, which was shown for the case gamma equals omega, and which I think is only published in the um, Kanamori Magito paper that was the precursor to Kanamori's higher infinite book. So I forgot the name now. And actually in that, in that proof that kind of the, the hardest part is missing. Um, so, so what does the theorem say? Um, so if we have two regular cardinals, gamma less than kappa, 
and choose as a winning strategy in the game u kappa gamma, so starting set kappa, length of game is gamma. <clears throat> then we actually do get a generically measurable cardinal below cap or less or equal than kappa, as witnessed by less than gamma plus closed forcing. And in particular, we get an inner model with a measurable cardinal. Um, so note that there's like um, a gap. I mean, I can, there, there, we move like cardinality for one step. So here we do get a generically measurable cardinal as witnessed by less than gamma closed forcing. And before we started from a generically measurable cardinal, as whoops, as witnessed by less than gamma plus closed forcing. Peter, sorry, coming back to the same issue. I mean, is it just the fact that if it has this much closure, then the ultra power is automatically well founded? Is that what's going on? Oh. Because you have all the omega sequences mm. or something. Right, right. Is oh, that that, that could well be, yes. We that, That's probably true too. So we probably, because, I mean, our forcing here will always be at least countably yeah. close because gamma will be at least omega. And yeah, then I, I guess I guess we get well-foundedness for free. Yes, that right, should be right. true. Yeah, that's, I think, is maybe true. And that's what's going on here. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great, Good. yes. Thanks. Okay, so, no, so, so yes, thanks as well. Um, So note that there's an um sort of interleaving um hierarchy. So, um. So we kind of have generic, generically measurable as witnessed by less than gamma plus closed forcing gives us a winning strategy for choosing the game of length gamma. And this in turn gives us um, generically measurable as witnessed by less than gamma closed forcing. Um, all right, so yeah, that's kind of um, nice. So we don't know really if we can reverse any of these uh, things in some way. That's one of our open questions, I guess. Um, so choose can also win at successor cardinals. Um, that's um, essentially due to labor in the 1970s. Um, I'm not sure. I think this proof might not have been published either, but it's not 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 very hard. Um, so you just do a standard Levy collapse. So you um, start with regular cardinals gamma less than lambda, and um, kappa greater than lambda is measurable. And then we just um, do a standard Levy collapse to turn kappa into lambda plus. And um, then in the generic extension, choose will have a winning strategy in the game um, with starting set lambda plus and of length gamma. So in particular, um, I guess choose can win the game on um, omega two of length omega. So we, so we saw that there was this result <laughs> before that choose cannot win the game on two to the omega of length omega. So in particular, choose cannot win the game on omega one of length omega. But so this tells us like the next step is already possible. Choose can win the game on omega two, playing for omega many steps. Okay, so these are kind of the two um, well-known classical results about these games. Um, so the next slide is just for making a little remark. Um, that kind of leastness is interesting for these games, leastness of the starting set. So the remark is just that if choose is a winning strategy in some game U kappa gamma, and kappa is um, at most, uh, is less or equal than lambda, then they also have a, star a winning strategy on this larger cardinal lambda. Um, and it's very simple, you just, um, I mean, if you, if you have to, if you choose and you have to play on lambda, just consider restriction of everything that happens to Kappa and just pretend you're playing on Kappa and make your choices according to your strategy for Kappa. So I guess in this picture, X and Y are supposed to be Kappa and Lambda. And so the, the red part is meant to be um, a division of, or a partition of um, Y into two pieces given by cut, but obviously this induces a partition of X into two pieces. And if the strategy for choose, for the starting set X tells choose to pick this red piece, then choose will, should pick the larger red piece or the superset piece in the game on Y. And then obviously if the intersection of the choices with respect to the X game is non-empty, then the same will be true for the choices with respect to the Y game. So this is not an interesting observation, I mean, by itself, but it tells us that what's interesting is to look at the smallest kappa so that choose can win um, the game of length gamma on starting set kappa. Well, if there is any at all, obviously, because I mean, choose winning any of these games 
has consistency strength of a measurable. So of course, it's easy to have uh, universes where choose doesn't win any of these games ever. For example, um, just take the constructible universe L, of course. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> we, if we start over a canonical in a model for a single measurable cardinal, then the above result saying that um, choose wins at a measurable cardinal, this easily gives you that um, this measurable cardinal will also be least. Um, and in fact, yeah, will also be least uh, such that choose wins uh, there. Basically, because if choose one somewhere smaller, then we would get a generically measurable cardinal below, but there cannot be generically measurable cardinals below uh, kappa for in the model of the form L of U with U and measurable ultra filter on kappa. Mm. Okay, and so we, we've seen that choose can win at basically any successor cardinals like omega two say, and this argument also easily gives that um, any successor of a regular cardinal can be least such that choose wins the, ga the game of some length lambda, I guess as long as the regular cardinal is um, sufficiently large. Uh, so what was it um, larger than at least gamma double plus it has to be. Um, okay, so what's an interesting question though is can choose first win this game at small inaccessible cardinals? So we know that choose can first win at a measurable cardinal. What about non-measurables which are inaccessible? And so we showed that um, if we have a measurable cardinal kappa and gamma less than kappa is regular, then there is a forcing extension in which kappa is inaccessible but not measurable anymore. In fact, not even weakly compact. However, this kappa is the least lambda such that choose wins uh, on starting set lambda. Mm. And so I have a small proof sketch here. Um, so we first forced with a reverse Easton iteration, adding a Cohen subset to every inaccessible cardinal below kappa. And that's our ground model now. I mean, that's what I will call ground model for the remainder of the argument. Um, so kappa will be our measurable cardinal. Um, and so, that's just a standard argument. So if we add a Cohen subset to kappa, this will ensure that kappa is measurable again in that further extension. And so we don't add a Cohen subset to kappa though, but um, I mean, this is also another kind of standardish trick. Um, so we add a homogeneous kappa Suslin tree, but now with the extra ingredient that this tree is supposed to be closed under ascending gamma sequences. So if we go up the tree for gamma many steps, um, we find, I mean, any sequence going up the tree in this way will have an upper bound in the tree. Um, so in, in that extension, kappa um, will be, um, so that extension now means uh, the extension after we add this homogeneous kappa Suslin tree that is closed on these ascending sequences. Um, in that extension, kappa is generically measurable, um, which is just witnessed by forcing with, um, with the tree T again, because that's another kind of standard argument because the two-step iteration of first adding such a tree and then forcing with it is just equivalent to adding a Cohen subset of kappa. But of course, in that model, um, kappa is not um, is not uh, weakly compact, so in particular not measurable because we have a kappa Suslin tree in that model. Um, all right. So that's kind of a rough sketch of the argument. I mean, there's lots of details to check, but this is really all of the idea. Um, okay, so this shows that choose can also first win cut and choose games over fairly small inaccessible cardinals. But actually an, an open question is that, well, can choose also win cut and choose, first win cut and choose games over the least inaccessible cardinal? And for example, just ask this question for um, the cut and choose game of length omega. So can choose first win the cut and choose game of length omega on the least inaccessible? So yeah, it's kind of, um, I don't know. I, I was think I thought about this for quite a while, but um, I couldn't really get anywhere. So I think this is kind of a nice question that I don't know the answer to. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, Mm. first part of the talk and now this talk is a second part how long am i talking already okay actually i'm quite fast um and so in the second part i want to look at generalizations of these games and um and show that um 
these generalized games are strongly related to lots of uh, important satiric notions. And well, I think this is a good argument that these games are kind of nice and useful. Um, and yeah, so let me get into that. Um, so I guess so, so far we always have cut cutting sets into two pieces and choose picking one of them. And well, it's very natural to um, generalize this and let cut, um, well, say in each step, cut, um, cut the starting set X into a larger number of pieces. So we could have it cut into countably many pieces or whatever, um, but we want to do something more generally straight away. Um, so we fix an ideal I on Kappa and we let cut play an I partition in each move. I will remind you what an I partition is in a few moments. Um, and yeah, as I said, um, these will turn out to be very useful. Um, so let's fix an un regular uncountable cardinal Kappa and the less than Kappa complete ideal I that contains all bounded subsets of Kappa um, kind of for the rest of this talk, I guess. Um, so what's an I partition? It's a very simple thing. Um, it's basically a disjoint partition, but um, a maximal disjoint partition with respect to I. So it's um, a collection of I positive sets. So I plus is just a collection of all um, subsets of X, which are not in I. Oh, sorry, no, what am I saying? Oh yeah, sorry, I, I is an ideal on Kappa. Let, let me start again. Um, so an I partition um, of some X in I plus, and I plus is just a collection of all subsets of Kappa, which are not in I. So such an I partition is just a maximal collection of I positive subsets of X. So I positive again, just means not in I being in I plus. So a maximal collection of I positive subsets of X, such that any two have intersection in I, if they're distinct, of course. So any two distinct elements of our I partition have small intersection, they have intersection in I. And what's important as well is it's maximal. Okay, and so, on this slide, I will introduce like three versions of generalized cut and choose games. And I'm not really expecting you to remember the definitions, but I just want to like show um, which, um, which variations we consider and which variations are possible. I mean, they are kind of natural, but um, yeah. So uh, don't, don't be scared by all of these notations. So when I use them, I will try to remind you each time what the, this game is supposed to be. Um, so the first one that we I want to introduce is the game G new x i less than gamma so we have four parameters now but three of them are kind of obvious so x is again our starting set it's just some i positive set then i is now always our ideal on kappa and well gamma is the length of the game and then this less than i will i will say in a uh, in a few seconds what it's supposed to be and then we also have this new here so let's see what does it say um so this here denotes the cut and choose game of length gamma. So as before, gamma will always be the length of our games. And now it's, it's a natural generalization that you probably were expecting. Mm. Rather than cutting uh, the set X into two pieces in each move, cut will present an I partition in each move. And so that's what the new is for. So cut will actually present an I partition of size at most new or we also allow for new being infinity, which just means there's no restriction on the size of the I partition here. Um, okay, and well, so cut presents such an I partition and then choose um, in a strong analogy to our original game choose, we'll just pick one of those, one of the pieces or one of the elements of the I partition. And now choose wins, in case at any stage delta less than gamma, the intersection, the intersection of their choices up to stage delta is I positive. So this, this is what the, the less than here in the, in the notation is related to. So we don't ask anything at the final stage gamma, but we only ask at all intermediate stages that the intersection of choices up to that intermediate stage is I positive. So obviously this game doesn't make any sense if you play for length omega. So gamma will um, usually be something larger than, uh, gamma will be something larger than omega if we ever consider this game. Okay, and then there's two more versions, which is just minor variants. So one, whoops, oh, I think I enlarged my screen, um, but I, I think it's still okay. Um, uh, 
Um, 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 so let so this is the variation of the above game, and we replace the less than with a less or equal than. And now this is more similar to the games we had before. And it, it's like the less than game up there. But in order for choose to win, we additionally require, we additionally require that the intersection of all of the choices is non-empty. So that's kind of like in the games before, but we also require the thing from up here for choose to win, namely that at all stages before gamma, the intersection of the choices up to that stage is I positive. Okay, that's the second game. And oh no, I did something stupid. Um, sorry. Um, wait, maybe I exit here and I make it full screen again. Um, okay, so let's hope it works now properly. Um, Okay, and then the third game is just a gamma here with no uh, less than symbol of any kind in front of it. And this just means that um, we, in order for choose to win, we require that the intersection of all of the choices is I positive. And then, I mean, th this trivially implies this um, condition on the intersection of choices up to any intermediate stage. So this is outright stronger. Um, so this, I mean, so these games here are ordered in terms of strength, obviously. So this, the topmost game is the easiest to choose to win. <coughs> the middle one is a little bit harder, maybe, and the bottom one seems to be even harder. Yet. Mm. Okay, so that's that's a bit of notation, but I think it's quite natural, and I will always try to remind you about these things. So, so yeah, so there's just these parameters: the starting set, the ideal, the length of the game, and then possibly these symbols denote these minor variants. And then we have the we have this uh, subscript, which is just um, the, the limitation on the size of um, the I partitions that cut is allowed to play. Um, all right. So, um, but now um, in these games, cut has a lot more possibilities and suddenly it becomes interesting and maybe possibly even more interesting to look at uh, winning strategies for cut in these games. So I think for most or maybe even all of the remainder of this talk, I will talk about winning strategies for cut in these games. And so I would just like list some, first start some with some easy observations which show that um, um, winning strategies for cut or non-winning strategies for cut in these games are equivalent to some prominent saturatic principles. Um, so the first one is weak compactness. Um, so let's BD kappa denote the bounded ideal on kappa. And an easy observation is that a cardinal kappa is weakly compact if and only if cut does not win. I mean, cut does not have a winning strategy in the game on kappa with respect to the bounded ideal of length kappa. Um, Cut, I mean, sorry, choose already wins if the intersection of the choices at any stage less than kappa in the game is an unbounded subset of kappa. And the two here just means that actually, as in our very first game of today, cut cuts into two pieces in each step. So that's really just if you look at uh, the right characterization of weak compactness, which is the filter property in this case, then this is really just. Um, what the filter property says, if you think about it for what this means, really. Um, okay, so this is just a, a very simple observation. Um, okay, the next one, the next properties which are a bit more interesting are distributivity and precipitousness. <clears throat> so basically, so let's maybe start from the end in this observation here. So if you look at the property of cut not having a winning strategy in the game, chi new x i gamma so this this means um i is just your ideal on uh, kappa gamma is the length of your game um x is um a, an i positive set and nu is the limitation on the size of the i partitions so if you have that for any i positive set x cut does not have a winning strategy in this game this um just means that um, your ideal i is gamma nu distributive or equivalently the Boolean algebra p kappa mod i is gamma nu distributive. And really, if you look at the right standard um, characterization of distributivity or maybe even the definition of distributivity and look at what it means for cut not to have a winning strategy in this game, 
um, it's it's really just the same thing. So there's nothing to prove here, really. But um, this this property is just outright the same as um, this notion of distributivity for ideals. Um, and then another theorem, which is essentially due to Yek, and um, well, is that precipitousness actually can be characterized in terms of a winning uh, and not the not existence of a winning strategy um, for cut in a particular cut and choose game. I mean, so this this is, for example, I mean, this is like a standard uh, equivalence of precipitousness, which can be found in the X book. It's not really formulated in terms of winning strategies there, as far as I remember. But if you look at it, that's really just what it says. So let me let me read the theorem. Um, so an ideal I on kappa is precipitous if and only for any a I positive set X. <clears throat> cut does not have a winning strategy in the game G infinity. So that means cut can play arbitrary large I partitions with starting set X, the ideal I, and the game proceeds for omega many steps. And so less or equal than omega just means that the requirement after omega many steps is that um, the intersection of choices of choose has to be non-empty in order for a choose to win. So cut wins if the intersection is empty. So since there are no limit ordinals below omega, that's that's the only thing we ask here. So I mean that's that's yeah, it's kind of a well-known thing, but it's maybe it wasn't like um, realized observed in this um, sort of fashion that this is really just a winning strategy property for particular games. Okay, um, but actually the, the connection between precipitousness and um, and winning strategies for these cut and choose games is even closer than that. And so that's what I want to talk about for most of the remainder of this talk. So let me remind you what precipitous games are. So these are, I mean, precipitousness has a very well-known game characterization in terms of what at least I want to call now precipitous games. Um, so how are they defined? We denote them as P, I, gamma. So I is some ideal and gamma <laughs> is the length of the game. And we have two players. And so we now call them empty and non-empty. So that this means we can also easily distinguish them from um, players in this other game because they were choose and cut. Um, so those two players, empty and non-empty, take turns to play I positive sets, which form a subset decreasing sequence. So this means those two players alternate and they play smaller and smaller I positive sets. Empty starts, non-empty, however, goes first at all limit stages. Um, and non-empty wins if the intersection of all of the choices is non-empty and empty wins otherwise. That's why the names of the players. Okay, and that's, I mean, for precipitousness, usually, I mean, you just consider the game of length omega here. So it's, it's a well-known standard result that an ideal I is precipitous if and only if empty does not win the precipitous game on I of length omega. Um, so the following uh, result thus generalizes our earlier characterization of precipitousness via cut and choose games. And this result is uh, due to Yek and, and, and Boban Velichkovic for gamma equals omega. And it nicely generalizes for, for a larger gamma. You just have to be slightly careful. So for example, you have to make sure that non-empty goes first at limit stages so that, um, so that um, you can continue for more for longer. Um, but but basically it, it nicely generalizes. Um, and so this theorem tells us that the games, the precipitous game and this particular cut and choose game here, they are essentially equivalent. And that is empty wins um, the precipitous game of length gamma, if and only for any I positive set X, cut wins um, the cut and choose game with arbitrary large I partitions of length gamma, where the winning condition is I positive intersection and the winning condition for choose is I positive intersection at all stages before gamma and non-empty intersection at stage gamma. But also non-empty wins the precipitous game of length gamma if and only for any I positive set X choose wins that um, cut and choose game. Um, so, I mean, for the equivalence between or for the uh, characterization of precipitousness before, I guess we only needed the upper bit about when empty wins um, these games. And actually, I guess we... Yeah, no, right. But and then this is additional information. I mean, this this has kind of nothing to do with 
the property of precipitousness, but it tells us that the precipitous game and this cut and choose game, they are really very closely related. And all right, and I, I will talk about this a, 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 a bit more in a moment. So actually, I want to I want to show one out of, I mean, so this proof of this theorem kind of has four directions. They're all kind of similar. And I want to probably show one of those four directions in a bit. But let me first generalize this a little bit further. So we can actually um, generalize um, precipitous games and cut and choose game to partial orders um, in a very natural way. And I think they look probably to set theorists, those will look even nicer than the games we looked at so far. So um, take any partial order Q and the condition um, lowercase Q in there. Um, and now let's just define the precipitous game P on this partial order Q of length gamma. So we have two players, we still call them empty and non-empty. And again, they take turns. Um, and now they will just play increasingly stronger conditions in the partial order. Mm. And non-empty wants to make sure that these conditions that they play have a lower bound and empty, well, wants to make sure that this is not the case. So that's a very natural uh, generalization of precipitous games to partial orders. And then um, let's look at um, the generalization of cut and choose game to games to partial orders. Um, so the notation is now G infinity. So we just look at, um, well, our subscript now will always be infinity. Um, we have a starting condition, lowercase q, the partial order q, uppercase q, and then the length of the game is gamma. And it's very simple. So cut just plays maximal antichains of the partial order in each step, and choose picks one of the elements of those maximal antichains. I mean, of the, of the, anti, of the antichain that uh, cut has just uh, played. And choose simply wins if the set of the choices has a lower bound in Q, just like for the um, just like for the precipitous game on Q. Okay, and then um, I mean this is um, this is really just a generalization of what we had before, um, because this is this is really about um, playing on the part. This is a special case of playing on partial orders of the form P kappa mod I. And now here we play on arbitrary partial orders. And basically the, <coughs> the, the same argument um, shows that um, those two games, um, P and G infinity um, on partial orders are essentially equivalent. <coughs> that is empty wins if and only if cut wins and non-empty wins if and only if choose wins. Okay, and well, and then obviously, if you look at what um, what it means for non-empty to win this game, this means that uh, the partial order is less than gamma plus strategically closed. So, so this is also kind of nice. I mean, you can characterize this. I mean, I mean, probably the the the, the, the original characterization of strategic closure in terms of uh, winning strategies for non-empty in precipitous games is simpler, but still, it's nice to have it characterized as a um, as uh, choose having a winning strategy in this cut and choose game here, um, which looks um, at first sight, I think quite different. I mean, if you look at these games, um, I mean, the game P, the precipitous game, it's kind of very symmetric because both players do the same thing. They just play stronger and stronger conditions. And um, I mean, they just want to achieve different things in the end. So non-empty just wants uh, a lower bound of the sequence of conditions and empty wants to avoid um, a lower bound or avoid having a lower bound. But in the, in the uh, cut and choose game, I mean, it's like super asymmetric. So cut um, provides maximal anti-chains and choose picks elements of these anti-chains. So, so that's, by the way, so that's why we call these games asymmetric cut and choose games because the, the two players the two players cut and choose, they do, they do very different things. So there's also versions of these games um, where like both players um, do some cutting and choosing. Um, we haven't really looked at that. Um, so yeah, but so, I mean, I mean that's, that's what I wanted to point out here is that these two games seem to be quite different, I think, on first sight because the one of them is very symmetric and the other one is pretty asymmetric. Um, okay, but they are actually very, very closely related. And yeah, so as I said, we can characterize strategic closure, closure in terms of um, winning strategies for cut and choose games on partial orders. Okay, but now uh, let me give the only non-trivial proof. Or let me see, how am I doing on time? 
Yeah, I think I'm still below an hour. And yeah, then... you have plenty of time. Okay, great. Um, so let me try to do this slowly. I mean, I think I will need like 10 to 15 minutes for this proof at most. Um, okay, so I'm just doing the case um, for length omega, which is uh, completely to do Boban, um, but it, it gives um, all the main ideas really. Um, and it makes the notation simpler. So let me show that if choose wins the cut and choose game, um, where um, choose just plays arbitrary large anti-chains, so the infinity here just means arbitrary large, um, the below in the partial order Q below our condition lowercase q um, for omega many steps, if choose wins this game for all lowercase q, then non-empty wins um, the precipitous game on Q of length omega. And remember, that was just the game where both players play stronger and stronger conditions, and non-empty wants a lower bound. And here also, uh, choose wants a lower bound of their choices. Let me just check one thing, actually. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. So I, I just realized I had one typo here. Um, because it, when I defined the game G infinity, lowercase q, uppercase q, gamma, which I highlighted here, I was just saying that cut plays maximal antichains of Q, but what I should have said, because now lowercase Q actually doesn't appear at all, what I should have said is that cut plays maximal antichains of the partial order Q below this lowercase Q here. Sorry, I forgot about this. Um, so that's how the lowercase Q comes into the definition um, of the game. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's... Um, so that's uh, so now it makes sense to say um, choose wins this game um, for all lowercase q in the partial order uppercase q because they are different games. So the, 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 in, in the game with lowercase q, uh, choose will play um, anti-chains of uppercase q below lowercase q in each step. All right, so I guess you probably should know now what those two games are. So let me try to slowly go through the proof. Um, on the first slide, actually nothing much is happening. So the proof will just proceed on the second slide. So on the first slide, all we do is that, well, so what um, So what do we want? We, we want to assume that choose has a winning strategy for this cut and choose game here. And we want to produce a winning strategy for this um, precipitous game. And okay, so suppose empty starts, um, a run of the precipitous game by playing some condition Q0. And now we have to produce an answer for a non-empty, making use of this strategy here. So let sigma um, denote a winning strategy for choose in this um, cut and choose game here, where cut plays anti-chains and choose picks elements. All right, so that's we have by our assumption. And so here's a long sentence, which doesn't really say much. I just want to introduce some simple notation. So we can identify sigma with a function f, which um, on input wi for i less or equal than n, that's just supposed to be the first n plus one, I guess, many antichains that cut plays in this game. So cut plays an antichain each step. That's the first n plus one many. Um, and um, so our function f will get this as input and produces as output a response for choose to this uh, partial run. I mean, all I'm really saying is that, um, I mean, for sigma, for a strategy sigma, formally we input all the moves so far, but of course we just have to input the moves of cuts because we can, when we assume that uh, choose follows the strategy sigma, so we know what choose did in all of the previous moves. And so our strategy is really just a function and for arbitrary long finite input sequences, it tells us what choose uh, should do next in order to win, right? So that's all I'm saying in this um, sentence. Nothing is happening here really. And so this is um, saying what the strategy is, but it's like the standard strategy that you usually do when you have two games around and you want to transfer things from one to the other. That is, um, we want to describe a winning strategy for non-empty in the precipitous game, making use of... <coughs> making use of some sort of auxiliary run of this um, of this um, cut and choose game for which we do have a winning strategy for choose. All right, um, so some very uh, standard notation that I'm introducing here is Q less or equal than lowercase Q is just all the conditions in 
uppercase Q, which are below lowercase Q. So um, yeah, that shouldn't surprise you. Okay, and now we've we've we've, we've set things up, and now the actual proof starts. But it's yeah, and it's it's kind of uh, kind of a very uh, cute argument, I think. Um, so so remember, maybe sorry, let me go back for a second again. So what happened so far? Nothing much except that empty started to play by playing some condition q0 in this precipitous game and we somehow want to produce a response um, for non-empty because we want to figure out moves for non-empty which make sure that non-empty wins okay and so how do we define the first move of non-empty we define some strange set with uh, some notation that doesn't make any sense right now so just um, ignore this for a second you will see in a moment what this is supposed to mean um, so we just look at the collection of all f of omega, uh, sorry, f of w, where w is a maximal antichain of q below q0. Um, so q0, remember q0 is the first move, let me go back once again, is the first move of empty in this precipitous game. And so now what we will play here <clears throat> is the cut and choose game on the partial order Q below the condition Q0, which was the first move of empty over there. So now we'll all the time be playing this game um, T infinity, Q0, Q omega. So the cut and choose game below the condition Q0. Okay, and so this set here, so the, the, the maximal antigens of Q less or equal than Q0 are exactly the possible first moves of cut in this cut and choose game. And F of this singleton W, this is just meant to be the sequence with uh, solitary entry W, F of this W is just the set of all responses to of choose or of the winning strategy of choose, say, rather. Um, all this, the set of all possible responses of the winning strategy of choose to possible first moves of cut, right? So this is a very simple set, actually. So that's what I denote sigma empty for now, and you will see soon why it is notation. Um, and now this is kind of the key claim of this um, whole proof here. Um, and it says that we can find a condition R zero below Q zero, <coughs> such that the whole cone of the partial order Q below R zero is actually contained in sigma zero, uh, in sigma empty set. So this might look a bit counterintuitive at first, but it's by a very, very simple argument. So assume this is not the case, but then see what this means. I mean, if this is not the case, then this means that the complement of sigma empty is stands below Q0, because it would mean that below any condition that's below Q0, we find a stronger condition that's not in sigma empty set, right? So not being able to find such an R0 here, means exactly that the complement of sigma empty is dense below Q0. Um, well, and then if we have a dense set below Q0, we can obviously pick a maximal antichain within the dense set, um, call that W. And now this maximal antichain will be disjoint from a sigma empty set because we have a dense set that's disjoint from, um, I mean, I mean the complement of I mean W is contained in the complement of sigma empty, so it's obviously obviously disjoint from sigma empty, uh, empty set. Well, but now look at um, the definition of sigma empty set. This is nonsense because um, I mean we have some W which is a um, legitimate possible first move of cut in our cut and choose game. And so we can input it to our strategy sigma, which is represented by this f here. So f is just the same as sigma, basically. Um, and so the response of our strategy sigma is just by the definition of the game and element of this antichain. Um, but then sigma empty set was just the collection of all f of w's for maximal antichains w. So this f of w in particular will also be an element of sigma empty. Well, but we have w being disjoint from sigma empty. So this is a contradiction. Right? So we've shown this here. We've shown that we can actually find the condition R0 below Q0 such that the whole forcing below R0 is contained in this that sigma empty. Okay, so you, um, you probably don't see why this helps us with anything, but um, they will help us picking a, um, a response of non-empty. 
So remember, nothing has happened. Nothing much has happened in our game so far. <clears throat> only empty has played. Only empty has started the game playing Q zero, and we want to find a response of non-empty. And so what we do now is we let non-empty pick such an R zero as their first move. So non-empty picks an R zero such that actually the the whole cone of the forcing below R zero is contained in this set sigma empty set. Right, um, so I mean that's what we do, and you will see in a bit why this um, why this will help us. Um, okay, so we have a move for non-empty, and now well, empty does whatever they want to do. So we're already in round two in our precipitous game, <clears throat> and empty plays a condition Q one, which is stronger than R zero. So note that we haven't made any any single move in the cut and choose game so far. I mean we've looked at potential moves, but nobody has made an actual move in the auxiliary cut and choose game, but now we, we do. Um, so now, and that's kind of the trick how we make use of this thing up there. So now cut will play, now we'll cut will make their very first move in the cut and choose game, and they will play a maximal anti-chain W0 of Q below Q0, uh, such that F of W0 equals this Q1 here as their first move in the cut and choose game. And so the point is now that um, we've chosen R0 such that all the conditions below R0 are responses of the strategy to particular first moves of cut. And so Q1 is just one such condition below R0. And this just means that there is a first move of cut such that the response of choose of the strategy of choose to that first move is exactly this condition Q1, right? And so that's what we let cut do. Well, and then choose follows the strategy, so will they will um, respond with Q1. And so now the key idea is that wait, so we have empty has played Q1 in the precipitous game. And we want to show that non-empty wins. So we want to show that we will have a lower bound of the conditions played in this game. But now this, the winning strategy of choose has played Q1 as a move of choose in the cut and choose game. And also in that game, we want the choices of choose to have a lower bound in order for choose to win. And we, we know that choose wins. So we know that the, the, the QIs that choose picks in the cut and choose game, according to their strategy, they will have a lower bound. And so this will give us Essentially, that um, the moves of empty, or it does in fact all the moves in the precipitous game, also will have a lower bound, and so non-empty will win that game. And so, basically, we have to, we just have to um, argue that we can continue in the same um, way. And now, what we do is we look at um, the set which I now denote the sigma w zero, and this is just supposed to mean well, the first move of cut it has been w zero. And now we look at all the possible second moves of cut and all the responses of the strategy of choose to those two moves, where only the second one, the W varies. Yeah, that's the set sigma W zero we consider. And basically the same argument, or really the same argument gives us that um, now we find a condition R1 that's below Q1, such that the whole cone of the forcing below R1 is contained in this set sigma W zero. And now we let non-empty respond with such an R1. Well, and we can we can we can go on like this. And now we can um, now um, um, empty will play Q2, which is less equal than R1. But this now this means that we can pick um, we have we can simulate the cut and choose game, letting cut pick an anti-change such that the response of the winning strategy of sigma is exactly this Q2, which is the second or third, a third move of empty in the precipitous game, right? As you can see, it's, it's just, um, yeah, we, we're just moving back and forth to these games with kind of a delay. So we're in the cut and choose game, we're always one, one move behind, really. Um, but really, in the end, we will play basically all the same conditions in these games. And we know that choose wins the one game, so, um, so non-empty wins the other. Okay, so that was um, that was one of the four directions of proof, and um, yeah, as far as I remember, the other um, three directions they are kind of uh, similarish. I mean, if if you have these ideas, the other directions proceed in a similar way.
All right. Um, so let me come to the last slide. Um, and um, so just as an open question, um, which uh, might have become obvious by now, um, and it says something which is actually not true. I just realized shortly before my talk. So I'm saying that for all the cut and choose games that we considered, the consistency strength of choose winning them is that of a measurable cardinal. Was that true? I think there was this one result about weekly compacts. Um, oh no, but that was about cut not winning. Sorry, I think it's true what it says actually. Yes. So I think all the games that we looked at, um, the consistency strength of choose winning any of them is that of a measurable cardinal. And it seems surprisingly hard to say anything about um, about separating these games. Um, like, um, for example, there's this annoying question. I mean, we just um, look at um, 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 variants of the winning conditions for choose and say we ask for one element in the final intersection of things or two elements or three elements, and we can't say much. So for example, we can't differentiate in any way between the game where choose has to have two elements in the final intersection of things or three elements. And in fact, if we play on kappa, say, we can't differentiate between that and the game where choose has to have kappa many elements in the final intersection. Um, so, yeah. And I think we also can't say too much about different lengths of games. So, yeah, I mean, there's many open questions about these games. And, yeah, I think they're kind of fun. And, yeah, that's it. Thanks very much, Peter. That was super, super interesting. Um, questions for Peter? Anyone? Going once, going twice. Okay, Peter, th thanks again. I like the open questions also, but I can see why they're really hard. Yeah. So I like the first one. I like the one with the least inaccessible. Oh, yes. I, yes, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I recently tried to, to think about this again. And first, I was pretty sure I could, it should be possible to show that, like, the least cardinal where choose can never win, like, the least inaccessible where choose can never win, could not be the least inaccessible cardinal. But yeah, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure at all anymore. Maybe they can, but I don't see how to show that either. So yeah, it seems to be difficult. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. That was the one that really caught my attention. But... Yes, yes, I would also like to know the answer, but yeah, <laughs> let's see. All right, let me stop the recording now.